In the topic I was supposed to, to talk to you about today is on mainly on biological determinants of health. But since you said you didn't have a, you know, a broader conversation on determinants of health, I'll walk you through a little bit on the major concepts uh, that are within the determinants of health category. And then we'll hone in directly more into the biological determinants of health. Um, so in order to understand different dimensions of health, uh, you need to understand a few more things. So based on what Pius was asking right now, what, how do we define health? Or, you know, what, what makes some people healthy and others unhealthy? So that's the first question you need to know. And the second question is, what are the dimensions of health status? So let's say that some people say you're healthy, some people say you're not, and at what dimensions, what are the normal ranges that we're looking at in, in saying uh, that people are healthy? And then how can we create a society which everyone has an equal opportunity and chance to live a long and healthy life? Uh, and, and to understand these dimensions of health status, you're required to understand something known as the ecological approach to health. As you may know, and some of you have a background in medicine and environmental science, when you look at ecology, you look at multiple different factors um, at play. Uh, that are uh, interacting with each other or they're influencing one another to give a particular uh, outcome. So an example of an uh, uh, ecological approach, something, one, one is called social ecology theory, which address uh, you know, some of the above questions that we're talking about. You know, what does the health mean? How do someone get healthy and how can you make them live a healthy and long life? So from an individual component, that is one component that you're looking at. Uh, Health status is related to the status of individual biology. And health status is also related to the status of individual behavior, health services that's available, environment, socioeconomic status, how much money these people have, and what whether there are governing policies or not, right? Um, just to give an overview, governing policies, let's say, you know, uh, the the... There are policies of free testing for HIV or not, or there is, you know, um, policies that allow for discriminate some kind of people and all these things. Environmental factors you also see in the morning, the kind of place you live and things like that. Uh, and then socioeconomic status, how much money you have or what kind of places you live that can give you access to different places that you can have um, access to better health. And then, so one and two, the individual biology and the individual behavior, these are based on your own genetic makeup and the rest of the items, number three, four, five, and six, these uh, operate uh, to uh, operate on this one and two to impact um, health. So there is a relationship between the health status and uh, um, and these are the different six factors. So ecological approach of the disease prevention and health promotion is anchored around the thought process of all these different six factors and how they're interacting, right? So there's a component of preventing people from getting sick and making sure that people remain healthy. And for you to be able to achieve this, you need to see how these components interact with each other. So um, ecological approach, it focuses on both individual and population levels to determine health and other intervention. Uh, so there's the same component. Once you start to look at these multiple determinants, you now start to look at how is it likely to be cost effective to use one stone to kill several birds. A simple example uh, would be to uh, look at one factor, let's say modify the environment in the case of malaria. The moment you do modifi environmental modification, you start to influence multiple other factors to improve health outcomes. Um, then, Within the context of determinants of health and ecological approach, the ecological approach underscores the fact that determinants go beyond the boundaries of the traditional healthcare. Koyo, we're not just talking about going to the hospital and getting treatment when you're sick, um, but also not just only looking at uh, the public health components. There's uh, many other components that you're looking at, the food component in terms of agriculture, the macro and micro environment modifications, education, housing, transportation, all these are important factors to look at when, when you're looking at you know, how to get a better healthy community using the ecological approach. So as, as, uh, as Pius just opened us uh, with the issue of definition of health, it's, it could be difficult to understand, uh, but then there are standardized definitions of that. 
But many of us think of health means the absence of disease or infirmity. To others, it may sound just a good physique, good mind, function of the body. But there are multiple different people who would look at health and define it differently, right? So, for example, if you, if for people who did medicine or have experience in anatomy, from an anatomy perspective, a body is considered healthy if it conforms to normal anatomical structures, right? So you have your two legs, two arms, ten fingers, uh, which are you know fingers and toes, and your body, uh, you know, anatomy is normal as per heart it should be. So from an anatomical perspective, that would be healthy. But then to a physiologist, it it's not enough to have normal anatomy, but there's how's the function? Is it normal bodily function as well? Uh, if you look at from the biochemistry perspective, yeah, you could have the functions, but you, you, your liver might be functioning normally, but the levels, let's say, if you drink too much alcohol or you, you, you have renal impairment, it might look normal, but the biochemical levels are slightly higher or lower depending on what you, you should be having. So that from the biochemical perspective, that uh, it becomes another concern of oh, whether it is healthy or not. From a pathology component, again, normal cellular makeup and function. From a genetic perspective, is, is there correct existence of genetic potential? Meaning, if this sperm and this ovum interact and they form, you know, uh, uh, a fertile zygote, can can this grow into a normal? Has a potential potential to grow into a normal, you know, human being? Uh, similarly, for a clinician perspective. Clinicians say there's no abnormality in the structure and function of the body. From an environmentalist perspective, it'll be you know good housing, adequate and safe water supply, clean environment. So uh, this is all. This is just to build up the fact that one when, when you're looking at health and, and and determinants of health, we can't really just point down on one thing and think that that is going to be giving us you know uh, and work on that particular component and see that we find good outcome. So. Ah, oh, I forgot this one. Uh, from a psychiatrist's perspective, this is is a well-adjusted and balanced personality. So, um, you know, the way you think, the way you feel, there's issues of mental health right now that are be getting more light and attention. And, and probably there are genetic factors that influence how you can be health-wise, healthy in terms of the mental health. So all these are different um, components that you need to, to look at. But according to the WHO definition, for you to be healthy, you need to be physically healthy, mentally healthy, no communicable, non-communicable diseases, live in a healthy environment, there are existing good policies for health, and there's good healthcare services and security. So this, these are some of the main components that, uh, according to, to the WHO, determine whether or not people would be healthy. I would encourage you to mute your microphones. No. I am now speaking so that we don't have uh, too much interference. Thank you. Yeah, so biological determinants of health. Now this is now we're honing down to one of the components, the, the 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 biological determinant, not necessarily environmental. So we now know what is health broadly, as determined by the environment. Uh, this could be internal environment or external environment. It also uh, well known at the root cause of both diseases and health. It involves you know there's multiple agencies that interact. In hierarchy at different levels so the hierarchical nature the way how this uh, uh these different multiple agencies interacting cause diseases bring to something known as uh, multiple causes agency so what is the cause of the cause of the cause of this thing so if if for some of the medical doctors or people have had experience with dealing with the the mortician reports uh when you go to 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 sign the death certificate there is something um called what is the immediate cause of death what is the secondary cause of death and what are the other contributing condition so let's say someone um uh, let's see in the chat so if if you will have a medical background so what will someone got got into a car accident yeah uh they were they're pedestrians they're walking in the road they got hit by a car they died i want to see in the chat what would you put as as immediate cause of death secondary cause of death and other contributory factors. This is an hypothetical person, a person just walking in the road, uh, crossing the road, they got hit by a car. If you are going to put in the death certificate, what is the immediate cause of death, secondary cause of death and contributing uh, um, uh, conditions? What would you put? Uh, two minutes. 
let's let me see the, the what you think would you put in that certificate in the chat someone was walking in the road they got hit by a car and they died in the hospital what will be the immediate cause of death secondary cause of death and other contributing conditions i'll wait for you guys to put uh, what you think in the chat Sir, should we write on the chat or should we respond directly? Either way, if, if you want to respond, feel free. But I want people to write also on the chat if you can, because not everyone will be able to speak. So you have two minutes to respond in the chat. And if you can say something, please, Karibu. Are you able to follow what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, good. So we are, we are following. Good. So, uh, uh, let's see. Just for uh, to attempt on filling the certificate for immediate cause, the mm -hmm. immediate cause for the death will be directly the injury that, uh, that, that client suffered, probably brain traumatic injury. Mm -hmm. Can be that one. That will be the cause for immediate use. Mm -hmm. And the secondary? And, and the secondary, se secondary cause of this will, will be, uh, let's say, some organization procedures. Mm -hmm. Probably the delay of, tra uh, of transporting the client to the healthcare service. The, the way, yes, sir. Okay, so I see other on the second cause maybe uh, uh, due to delay for trafficking uh, for transporting the client to the healthcare facility. Mm -hmm. That is the second cause. Probably he, he took much my time or uh, for response team to respond for that accident was a bit late. So how how fast the uh, the the healthcare providers are maybe the secondary cause. Okay. Uh, other contributing factors may be at the national level now. Policies and the rules. Probably we can target because we are talking about load accident. And those who are responsible to, to, to supervise or to see, uh, to take care of the road are policies and uh, particularly police. So uh, those traffic, uh, traffic officers, let's say, do they perform their duty properly? Uh, 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 are infrastructure well organized? That might be in the part of contributing factor. Okay. Thank you. The other people have responded as well in the chat. So Rehema Kiando says primary cause is loss of blood. Uh, Hosinu Palilo says immediate cause, uh, tension pneumothorax, secondary to frail chest or other contributing factors. Could be also liver restoration. Uh, another person is saying immediate, use HP, saying immediate cause is brain hypoxia. Um, happiness says brain hemorrhage, secondary cause could be traumatic brain injury. Secondary severe traumatic uh, or multiple trauma, uh, immediate cause severe hemorrhage, and secondary cause multiple organ failure. Right, interesting. So, from from pe people from the mostly from the medical background only uh, would would want to break it down into things related to biological uh, factors that cause that death. But it could be the major cause of death is of course traumatic brain injury. Secondary to uh, what was it? Let's see. There's one person that I think I like this. So primary could be loss of blood. That's why they died. Uh, secondary to uh, multiple uh, fractures or uh, impact, and this could be contributed by you know this person maybe was blind or maybe did not see well. So and how Pius also tried to to explain it is to look at all these factors from one level would be. Biological, a secondary level would be, you know, other external factors. So to be able to prevent this person from dying, 
you need to be able to prevent from a public health perspective, you also all the, come all the way back to the health promotion component and even understanding how, how these factors can, can interact with this. Because I didn't tell you the age of this. Probably this was a kid who couldn't walk, was just crawling, was too short. So the age contributed to how this child was just exploring the road and got hit by a car. So the multiple levels of looking at health and especially health promotion uh, into how do they influence, uh, how do they interact with each other? So, however, within, within the formulation, it, it's evident that biological factors could be more proximate than socioeconomic factors, which are more upstream, right? So as people were saying here, uh, brain trauma, brain injury, hemorrhage, et cetera. These are factors that cause the death of the person bleeding out, then they died. These are more proximate, more closer. But then this person is bleeding because he was hit by a car. And then he was hit by a car, maybe because the traffic lights were not working. So if you, you, you look at you know, different causes of health for this person or disabilities, the approach would be much more broader looking than only just, just one component. And this is, this is the main component of the social uh, ecology uh, components where uh, health is, is being embedded. So bio, it is the biology we are contributing social economic factors, and environmental factors op are operate and are being translated. So it is important to get to you know, these details of biological determinants of health. So biological determinants of health could be influenced in, in, in you know, cognitive, someone's or personality trait, which are biologically derived, fundamental aspects of this each, each person, life chances, different outcomes are being influenced by this cognitive and personality of this person. Could be personality traits, these acquired since childhood and, and probably could be modified um, you know, as they continue to change to adulthood, but these personality traits would also influence uh, health and mortality. So let's say someone is much more aggressive and and they like to fight with everyone all the time. So they're probably more likely to get into arguments and gang fights all the time and they get hit on the face, they die, right? Or someone is much more timid and does not really like to engage in fighting, so they retract more. So it, it all depends on, on also, again, um, interactivity of this personality trait. So which we will be talking about in uh, personality, which are individual differences in thinking, feeling, and behaving, which influence both communicable and communicable disease um, uh, risks. So there's this predictive power of personality, uh, and, and this is association between personality, mental well-being, and socioeconomic status, and health. These have been well well documented in other components, but among psychological factors that impact health, personality plays a pivotal role, like extremely, extremely crucial role, uh, as much as sometimes you might not be able to uh, uh, attribute this to your own, as your own cause, but your personality also underpins some consistency in which we think and act and do across uh, different uh, activities. So let's say I like to eat, I can eat a lot, so I become more, you know, uh, eat unhealthy foods, and then the outcome comes out good. So and the use, utility of knowing this is going to be the component of um, designing interventions to prom to do health promotion. Uh, so some things like in adult personality traits, these are partly genetically derived and they're taught to be derived from early life and shape exposure and social experiences. There are things like epigenetics. I don't know if any of you know about them. I'll, I'll talk to them I'll to you about them a little bit in the future. But this personality trait predicts different range of outcomes in lifestyle related to exposure to communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. If you if the, the, the people in the public health uh, promote use of condoms in, in when you have multiple sexual partners and then you don't do that, that means you expose yourself to you know sexually transmitted diseases and potentially you know uh, poor health outcomes. If you the public health component is advocating for better eating habits and you don't use better eating habits, then you're more prone to you know uh, getting diabetes or hypertension, and then you get into non-communicable diseases uh, more. So this this is something that come, goes without saying as you're understanding. So, but let's go deeper a little bit when it comes to biological determinants. That was just an overall looking at uh, at uh, uh, personality and things like that. But then let's let's pin down a conceptual framework in our minds of understanding this biological determinants of health. Let's look at uh, four discrete agencies. 
as a person, you have genetic makeup. You have external environment or external agency. You have internal agency, your internal body environment. And let's say you have um, aging as one of the factors. So think of think of an example of a, of a car. If, if any of you have, have seen cars or have owned cars, for a car to be able to be a car as it is, it depends on what design it is, how many accidents is it involved in, how is it maintained, is it going to determine how long is it going to last. So, I mean, if you design a car like a lemon, the moment you hit into one accident, the lemon crashes and it dies, right? It's, and then if it's poorly maintained, it might not have a chance to grow old. So the design is mainly the uh, uh, the... The, the some form of a genetic makeup you have, uh, how is it designed, uh, your body designed, uh, external factors, the accidents that you get, internal factors is how do you do you maintain your body or is it being maintained, uh, and and then we get to aging. So genes are things that you can't really choose. They're already uh, part of what you you are at the moment since the conception. There are options of doing genetic modifications, let's say for people like who have sickle cell disease, uh, there's now research that's ongoing to do gene therapy and all these other factors. So once you understand health from the genetic perspective, there are options to do modifications to help you get better health outcomes. Uh, I don't know how many of you ever heard of something called CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, just raise your hand or say yes in the chat. Have you ever heard of CRISPR Cas9? Right. Nobody. Uh, are you able? Are you guys still following me? Oh yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Rahma. At least I can see you following. Uh, no, 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 no. Hosanu, yes. Uh, Palilo, can you tell us what is CRISPR Cas9? If you remember that. You can unmute. Uh, oh, you mean you're following it, but you don't know what CRISPR is. Anyway, so CRISPR is is a is a is a very recent um tool that you can cut genes of your body. And this is, I'm assuming all of you understand what a gene is. You cut a gene, you remove it from the body, and then you put in a different type of gene that gives you a different phenotype at the at the end of the outcome. So meaning, let's say you have white, light-skinned, and there's an option of going in and cutting the gene that gives you light skin, and then putting in the gene that gives you darker skin, and you apply that into your gametes, and then the outcome will be a child who's darker skinned compared to, to what you are. So this is mainly genetic, genetic modification. I'm, I'm mentioning this because when you're looking at these factors, there are things that you might feel like you might not be able to change, but also you might be able to change later on. There's other external factors and, and internal factors, this internal, uh, uh, um, that and aging. And... So I have a short video here, which I would like you to watch. Uh, it sort of summarizes and gives examples of how these biological factors could be influenced uh, and, and how that works. So it's going to be like a minute or a minute and a half. So I hope you'll be able to hear it. If you can hear it, you say yes in the chat. And then there are the biological determinants of health. These are the particular biological characteristics that can determine our health outcomes, like our genes, sex, and age. And in public health, rather than looking at just like our kidneys, we're focusing on the biological factors that could affect our kidneys, like a family history of kidney disease. As we'll see, there are no hard borders between each determinant, and it's pretty much impossible to talk about one without stumbling into another one. Each determinant is related to the others, and a complete picture of our health destiny will always consider all three. But for now, let's focus on just biological determinants, looking at age as an example. In a kind of wild statistic, about half of all children will have at least one ear infection before they turn two. 
And while it's easy to chalk this up to kids just acting in profoundly germy ways, it turns out these ear infections are at least partially determined by kids' biologies. For one, children have shorter and more horizontal eustachian tubes, which are these kind of neat and super necessary tubes that help drain fluid from our ears to the back of our throat. But it turns out the particular shape of these tubes in children means that fluid is more likely to get trapped in the ear, which makes it the perfect destination for bacteria to do some serious growing. So just being a young kid actually turns out to be a major biological determinant of being prone to ear infections. Now, while our age isn't really under our control, it still changes over time, which affects the kinds of factors that influence our health too. A lot of biological determinants are like this. While they can seem permanent, they can actually change due to time, our behaviour or our environment. Let's go to the thought bubble for more. Let's say there are two identical twin brothers, Gus and Jack, who want to set out and open an organic guacamole business together. The brothers decide to split the business operations into two parts. Gus is in charge of growing avocados in an orchard out in the countryside, while Jack heads to the big city to handle the business negotiations. Now, Jack and Gus are both healthy, but they do have a family history of heart disease and skin cancer. So in this case, this shared family history is one of Jack and Gus's biological determinants of health. Anyways, out in the big city, a few years go by and Jack is kind of crushing it in the business world. He's creating a huge demand for his guacamole by networking with local brochures and promoting his guac all over the city. Jack spends most of his day tied to his desk, busily tending to phone calls with potential buyers. He doesn't have much time to exercise because, well, guacamole empires don't exactly run themselves. After a few years in the city, Jack begins to notice a feeling like there's a persistent squeezing in his chest. He goes to the doctor who diagnoses Jack with coronary artery disease, a condition which puts him at a higher risk of heart attacks. Meanwhile, back at the orchard, all that heavy duty avocado tending means that Gus is in the best shape of his life. His heart is healthy, but working on the farm also means he's spending a lot of time in the sun, which is a serious risk factor for skin cancer. Sure enough, Gus begins to notice an asymmetrical mole with irregular borders on his neck, which his doctor diagnoses as stage one skin cancer. Thankfully, Gus caught it early and was able to get it removed. But remember kids, always wear sunscreen. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Now, we can't know for certain if Jack and Gus were biologically inclined to have these particular health outcomes. But what we do know is that despite sharing nearly identical DNA and a family history of skin cancer and heart disease, each brother experienced unique health outcomes that were likely determined by differences in their environments. To deepen our understanding of the relationship between our biologies and the outside world even further, we can take a peek at a novel area of study, epigenetics. Now, we tend to think of our genetics as an impenetrable stronghold of me-ness at the centre of our cells. After all, our genes are made up of segments of our DNA, and our DNA is basically a big instruction manual that tells our bodies how to look and act and be, well, our bodies. But epigenetics says not so far. Epigenetics is the study of the outside factors that determine how much some genes are expressed in our bodies. According to epigenetics, everything from air quality to stress levels can factor into how our genes are expressed. Now, epigenetics doesn't mean your DNA sequence is actually changing or mutating. What's changing is your body's interpretation of your DNA. You can imagine epigenetics as a sort of chemical light switch inside your cells, which your environment and behaviours can brighten or dim, or even turn off completely. Let's travel back to the end of World War II, to the Dutch hunger winter, a famine that occurred when the Netherlands was experiencing a bitterly cold winter and a national food shortage. During this time, pregnant women who were starving were often giving birth to underweight, malnourished babies. Over the following decades, scientists continued to track these babies far into the future, when the famine was a distant memory and all those babies had grown up. 
what they found was that even decades later, people born during the famine were more likely to develop diseases such as heart disease, schizophrenia, and impaired glucose tolerance, a risk factor for diseases like diabetes. This suggested that their bodies were able to remember the stress experienced in the womb. And wouldn't you know it, researchers found that individuals born amid the famine had specific epigenetic markers on a gene that played a role in diabetes. This was the first observed instance of early environmental factors, like famine, resulting in epigenetic changes. With so many external variables at play, it can feel like our health destinies are trapped behind a veil of unknowability. But by continuing to study the determinants of health, we'll start to nudge that veil aside and get a peek at the complex factors at play. Right. So um, I hope that video sort of gave you some ideas of the roles of the biological determinants and how they could be influencing the environment. Sasa, uh, in the chat, or if you have an idea, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, what are the major takeaways, if there are two things that you will remember from this video? What are the things that you think you understood from this uh, from this video message? Uh, I'll give you two minutes to put it in the chat. What are the things that you think you remember from this video as key messages that you got? Um, let's go in the chat. Put in the chat or raise your hand if you want to say something so that I can, uh, can ask you to unmute. What are the key messages that you think you got from this uh, from this video. Karibuni. Zahra Balai Zahra Livhai. I think I hope, I hope I'm not butchering your name. You say your genetics play an important role. But to go with genes, there are other factors which play a role as well, like environment. Uh, Palilo says, even with the same genetic makeup, disease state depends also on the environment exposure and the behavior you have. Happiness says, biological determinants are not permanent throughout. The environment affects your genetics, so it could be changes. Alananga says, biological determinants include modification of genes from external um, it factors, um, yeah, biological, uh, Justus Kamara says environmental factors have influence on us. Yeah, so so this means even if you have a particular genetic makeup, um, where you live and how you live really is going to determine your health outcomes, right? So, I mean, no, because it depends on how, if you're eating junk food, you're going to be fat and unhealthy. If you do that continuously, and I think this is something that one of you know Professor Janabi from uh, used to say popularly that if you let's say eat another thing is epigenetic. The other the video talked about um, hunger during hunger. The, there's an epigenetic changes, but also if you eat too much, even if in your family you're usually not fat people, if you start to be the fat people in your family. For the longest time, that would be a, would potentially cause epigenetic changes that will influence the, your offspring as well. So it is important to think of how your personality is, the external factors, the genes that you have, and and other things that play. Oh, so that Zaihal says external factors play a great role. External factors afford by affect biological determinants. Uh, Lidwell says uh, genes can be modified to determine health population. Brilliant. Thank you. So, and I'm going to now take you to the last part of my, my presentation, where I'm going to give you other specific examples um, uh, that determine uh, such a biological determinants of health in terms of gene, external agency, internal agency, and aging, right? So, hypothetically, the first three of the four factors, the genes, external agency, and internal agency, could be eliminated through a perfect design. So, here we have a perfect gene set. Uh, you know, the perfect design, no accidents and external disruption, and an ideal maintenance the balance of internal dynamics. So the same. So if you have the perfect gene, perfect design, and you limit yourself from accidents or factors that external disruptions, probably be able to, to have um, 
uh, a better health outcome. So the, the car, for example, the human body would have an opportunity to die of natural causes, like as aging, which is rare, even if it occurs um, with either. So people, if you have this perfect set of the first three, the genes, the external agency, internal agency, the only thing that will kill you is your age. So, and now there's research that's ongoing into looking how do we prolong aging, right? So like telomeres in, in the genetic component, uh, redu reducing the, uh, uh, okay, I've probably used some words, that telomeres, these are genetic um, materials that would wear off and cause aging to pre prevent that so that people could live longer. So if you, you're able to control the first three, um, you can have a perfect life and die of natural causes of, like as aging because you just your body doesn't work anymore. But at individual level, biological and disease-related factors, for example, uh, malaria. So let's talk about age. Look at age specifically as, as a biological factor at an individual level. So for people who know malaria, how many of you have never had malaria in their lives? Put your put your put your 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 hand up in the chat. Kama hujawahi kuuma malaria tangu uzaliwe. Put say yes in the chat. I want to know how many of you have never had malaria. Rain Frida, congratulations. Where are you coming from? Uh, who else has never had malaria since they were born? Only one person. So I mean the rest of you. Okay. So how many of you wamewahi kuuma malaria? Let's see the chat. How many of you have had malaria in your in your in your, in, in your life? Uh huh. Palilo raised the hands, and one other raised hands. Oh, Bridget Mchao never had malaria. Okay, congratulations. Um, this is very interesting information. And who else? Alananga. Alananga never had malaria, or we've had malaria. Oh, this is very good. This means there are few people in this group that they've never had malaria. Oh, Alananga has had malaria many times. Okay, good. So, uh, Fadili has had malaria. Who else? Who else? I want to know. I want to know people who have had malaria. Who else? Zaikal, 10 years now since you had malaria. Good. Um, Rehema, since I was young, I had repetitive malaria. Oh, nice. This is, okay, not a good thing that you had, but uh, Tekla had malaria several times. Happiness, Diego, I raised the hand, I've become a malaria, had malaria several times. All right, so if you look at the proportion of people who've never had malaria compared to those who've had malaria, you see most of the people have had malaria more often than not, and a few of you have never had malaria. Now, so looking at malaria as an example of age, right? And most of you, some of you have said 10 years since they've had malaria last time, several times. How many of you have had malaria in the last... year Michael your Peter for the past one year how many of you had malaria okay I don't see anyone uh the past five years anyway the point I'm trying to bring home is that there are some diseases that just by the fact that you are older or you are younger, you will be much more prone to them than others, right? So for example, in malaria, the degree of immunity acquired by individuals living in endemic areas, remember this, this is different, right? So endemic areas, this is an environmental factor and you're talking about biological factor. It depends amount of exposure of infections have genetically determined immunological responses. So your genes have decided that if you live in an endemic, endemic area with malaria and get multiple exposures, you are going to get a, a particular response, right? So in a high stable transmission malaria area, malaria peaks, malaria infection peaks between the year of one and five years old. So once you're between one year and five years old, you've never been having malaria before. Now you start getting malaria, boom, 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 boom you start to develop something known as an immune response. So it's called premonition. And after five years of being hit by malaria every other week, you start to become resistant. So the biological determinant of health in this context is your genetic makeup 
that tells your body that, dude, you're getting too much malaria. You need to do something about this. And your body said, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'm going to develop something known as the immunity response as a premonition so that I don't get sick anymore, right? So in the areas where the exposure, in the malaria endemic area that have stable malaria transmission, you would have almost 25% of all causes of mortality of children is between under the age of 10 years, right? So, so this was the case in, 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 in previous time when there was no effective intervention. Kwamba, watoto enye chini ya miaka mitano, ndio wanakufa sana na malaria. Which was a big issue and a lot of campaigns started, environmental modification, uh, uh, you know, providing mosquito nets, you know, uh, doing all, even right now with the malaria vaccine, it's provided with children at the age of, of five in the countries that have done. But something interesting started happen. If you prevent people from getting malaria between the age of zero and four, that means they're not exposed to the malaria transmission. This means their bodies don't know what malaria is. Now you will see, if you look at the data, the people who get a lot of malaria and mortality is shifting, not only from zero to four, all the way to preschool from under 10 years old. Now they're much more vulnerable to malaria because they didn't get their dose of malaria infection when they are under the age of five. They're starting to get them when they are you know, in a preschool setting because between the age of zero and four years, mama and amweka kujineti and alanae, you know, they, they get all this proper care. Now they are toddlers and kids who can stay up late and play around at night, you know, do whatever they want to do, they get much more exposure. So just by the mere fact of age, you can see malaria outcome and health determinants caused by a disease such as malaria is going to be, is being influenced, right? So the same. So now if you live in a, in, a, in a place where malaria transmission is less intense, the peak is much later, right? So I just mentioned now, we're seeing 10 years or more because also the interventions that prevented infections at a less time age, so mortality shifts now to relatively higher. In low transmission or endemic prone areas, vulnerability remains across all ages. So if you've never had malaria in your life, ever, that means the moment you get malaria, you don't have the protective immunity. It doesn't matter even if you're older, you get hit by malaria, you get severe malaria. But then if you don't, if you're younger and you got your dose of malaria, that, like most of the people here, if you get malaria when you're older, you're more likely to go to work on Monday and, and continue with your life, you know, without even getting severe malaria because it's the premonition, right? So this is an example of age as a biological determinant that really influences how, how is the health outcome that comes out of it, right? So the same thing, we could do this all day long with many other factors. So another component, same malaria, uh, unfortunately, Malaria immunity does not last your whole life, right? So let's say you had, you were, uh, I, let me see who, for example, there's one person here, um, Lidwell Musukwa, Musukwa said he had several times malaria. And if Ivony had also malaria several times, Tekla, same. So if somehow Tekla, Ivony, and, and Lidwell decide to travel to the US or in Europe, and they stay there for 20 years, they will never have malaria because the likelihood of getting malaria is low, the immunity is going to go down. So it means the older they get, the more vulnerable they're going to be with malaria. The next time they get malaria, the likelihood of getting severe malaria becomes more, right? So I'm just trying to play around here with the, with the one biological factor of age, how old you are, and how that could be modified by your environmental factors and, and exposure and visits. The same thing with, with non-immune travelers who move from the US to Tanzania or Natakiwa to me, you know, medicine that prevents them from getting malaria because they can get death from malaria at any age. Tanzania is very hard to see people dying from malaria who are older because they've had already developed definition. Again, the same thing. If we talk about age, from the malaria, from the tuberculosis perspective, unlike malaria, the greatest mortality and morbidity related to, be, to TB is in poorer country occurs in the age of economic productive, economically productive group, 15 to 59 years. Why is this? Because these people probably are much more sexually active and they will contract other diseases, which are immunosuppressant like HIV, 
and then they can get lower immunity and then TB becomes much easy because TB is an opportunistic infection. Um, the same thing. So, so depends on how how you play around with the different factors. You can you should look at how these get influenced. The same thing we go. However, children in tuberculosis is likely to have been underestimated because more than fifty percent of TB in poorer countries do not present to health services. So, again, you remember if we're talking about these factors, there are policy and health access. You might say, oh, we're only seeing people with TB who are older, but um, maybe children who are under that age. They have TB in poorer countries that are just determined to come out. And they don't get presented to health facilities. They don't get services. And, and this also is another component that needs to be looked at, right? So this can be, you know, back and forth with many different factors. You can, we can, so I'm going to give you a question now in the chat. HIV. Uh, we have genes, we have external factors, internal factors, and age. In the chat, how do you think HIV would play around in these factors? Uh, would age, lower age, be a bigger determinant or a smaller determinant for HIV infection? If you are younger and getting HIV, which one would it be more or less? It's a very, very simple question. So just put it in the chat. Young people are more prone to getting HIV, true or false? Interesting. Some people are saying true, some people are saying false. Fadili, if you're in a position where you can say, can you justify your your answer? Why do you say young people uh, are, are more prone to getting HIV? Fadili Nabaraka, come on. Unmute your microphone and say, let's start with Fadili. Oh, Nani, Baraka Basi. Let's start with Baraka. What do you think? What, 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 justify your answer. You can unmute and then I will speak. Ah, so young people, for this is because young people are more active to sex. Okay, fine. Uh, but not necessarily children, right? I hope I hope you're not you don't mean children. Uh, okay. Uh, Lidwell says young as how old? Doctor Baraka says they're sexually active than old people. I mean, you. I don't know if you've met some old people. Some old people are much more sexually active than some young people nowadays. But anyway, um, the, the I, I think. This is this question that Lidwell asked here is extremely important. Lidwell says, young as how old? Age ranges, please. This is this is this is the whole point of understanding the biological determinants, right? Because you can't just say young people, but if you're talking about children between the age of zero months to, to 10 years who are not even sexually active, and then you try to associate that with HIV, right? So there's all these important factors to think about when you're looking at uh, at you know determinants of health. So yeah, so we, we could go ahead. So now, for example, here, for biological, socioeconomic reasons, adolescents and young adults bear the heaviest burden of HIV, not necessarily just children. So age becomes a factor, right? Um, you could look at, again, so for, for malaria, another example is sex. Uh, sex, gender, but sex. I think we do biological sex, male and female. Uh, which ones are more prone to getting, you know, what diseases? Some studies uh, show that uh, male-female ratio to different diseases uh, are influenced, but for malaria in, specifically, females are more prominent, pro more yeah. prone to malaria, mostly due to when they're pregnant. But then when they're not pregnant, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, a lot of these studies don't really show statistical significant difference in, in, in infection by sex if you're not pregnant. So now you're looking at the biological determinants, sex, women, pregnancy, lower immunity, lower immunity, much more vulnerable to disease, right? 
So it goes, it goes like that. We can keep going on the same. So next example for TB. Prevalence of tuberculosis among boys and girls age up to, are equal up to age of 15 years. Therefore, thereafter, male cases predominate, right? So again, so in the chat, tell me, why do you think um, um, men are more prone to having TB than women after age of 15? Anyone? So the question is, there's, there's a statement here that says, uh, prevalence of tuberculosis among boys and girls is equal up to age of 15, and thereafter, male cases predominate. What do you think would be the reason for this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Let me try. Haribu. Uh, according to that finding, that prevalence of tuberculosis among boys Mm -hmm. It's a bit high than than girls. Uh, it might be contributed due to the nature of job they perform. We know uh, most of girls they are performing home based activities, but most of the boys are performing that cumbersome task. For example, in the industries they are working, where they they get uh, the environment is not favor, so they might acquire that disease. So the, according to the nature of the activities performed by girls vis-a-vis uh, -vis boys, they make boys more prone to tuberculosis than girls. All right. Okay, thank you Pius, for, for that attempt. Uh, there is number 60432 something something says socioeconomic activities. Justo says maybe because they get to tend to be Dependent of the 15, which live in congested household, poor ventilation, interacting with the patients. You see, now, now you're already thinking from the from the from the you know one health component, right? So Justus has mentioned a lot of other factors that could be contributing to that. So more uh user HP says more men are more likely to be in overcrowded areas. Balilo says smoking behavior, which is very prominent in African countries, men than women. Uh, in, in European countries, it's the other way around. Uh, maybe at the age, the more males are immunocompromised from various causes in the JV, economic activities they perform. Oh, this is brilliant. Cultural differences, men get more engaged in sex. This is happiness, saying uh, than at that age than females, so chances the contract infection is lower from immunity. Happiness, these men, who do they have sex with? Um, if they're engaging more at that age, do they have sex with older women, or you know, so all these are things that we need to think about, right? Ignorance, oh, Zahrabai says ignorance when it comes to seeing doctors and availing healthcare. This is oh, thank you very much for bringing this up, Zahra, because young men at this age. Nick, it's something you're, you're disrupting our classroom. Anyway, so so Zara says something very profound. I think ignorance when it comes to seeing doctors and availing healthcare, men tend to think ah, mini kosawa to kidume. I don't have to go to the hospital or something, and you know they tend to progress to lesser. This is not necessarily related to TB, but general healthcare seeking behavior, right? So this is going to be another determinant. So I think uh, Zara, you have a lot of votes in favor of your 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 answer. So, so see, now these are the social determinants. So social ecology theory comes at play here. Right, so the same, we, we could, again, so I'm, I'm saying we could go over and over sex and pregnancy. We could play around with anemia, you know, newborns. We could play around with a lot of different factors. Uh, uh, you know, HIV primticity, prevention of mother to child transmission. And the question I asked before, whether or not children are much more HIV. Happiness, you have raised your hand. Do you have a question? Or was this something you, you raised before? Happiness. Biengo. 
you raise your hand. Is it something that you want, you want to say something? I'm a before. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the mission before. Anyway. <clears throat> so, so, um, yeah. So, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that these only one factor, age, we could play around with it, sex, genes, um, all these are biological determinants that we could work around and see how they would influence. For example, this is another thing, genetics and, and, and diseases. So, for example, malaria, there's something known as the um, polymorphism in the genes that affect different people. There are people who have something known as the Duffy gene. The Duffy gene is affecting how your red blood cells look like. And how your red blood cells look like, they can be slightly more sickled or a bit different, and you will not be able to be infected by Plasmodium vivax. Um, and this could be genetic environments or epigenetic environment, epigenetic changes that happen over the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years that during that period, maybe Plasmodium vivax is much and, and And probably now it's no longer as prevalent, right? So... Because because the bodies of the people adjusted, and this is plasmodium vivax Duffy gene issue, is is um is much more prevalent in West Africa, right? So some issues of of inherited erythrocyte disorders are profound, predominant in malaria endemic areas. We have issues of sickle cell, and and it's much more profound in in an African context because of presence of malaria. Malaria was there almost co evolved with human beings. So that influenced how we react to the malaria from epigenetic changes that becomes changes the genes to be able to influence how we react to this disease. Right? So all these components that are extremely crucial to look at. Um again, so you could look at another thing which is known as G G63. Uh, G6PD deficiency, which is glucose 6 -phos, uh, phosphate uh, deficiency, where people would not have a particular enzyme that would break down um, uh, particular types of uh, materials, and they would lead to much more hemolysis. And, and this, this, I'm sorry for people who probably have not had experience in much more detail in biochemistry, uh, this, but all these are different biological factors that determine the health outcomes of different people, right? All right, so I would like to end, not, not go into much more details of this, because I know there's a diverse people of, of, of I've talked about thalassemias, I've talked about sickle cell, uh, and, uh, you know, genetic and malaria. I'm talking about malaria mostly because this is something that is, is in within my strongest field, um, HLA-B53. All these are genetic associations that can protect against the disease or produce uh, or reduce vulnerability to malaria and fever and some of these issues. Okay, so uh, in summary, if you forget everything, if you forget everything we've talked about today, we have used social ecology theory to understand different dimensions of health status. There's an agent that causes a disease, there's a host that receives a disease, and there's an environment that modifies how we respond to this disease. And this is mainly based on the relationship between the health status of a person and these different six factors. But today we've primarily spoken about individual biology and some individual behaviors, which was a component of biological determinants. We did not talk strongly about health services or economic status or environment or policies. We just brushed through those components. But individual behaviors and individual biology, how that interact with these other the rest of three policies the three components determine the health outcome. Individual biology and individual behaviors with these are internal environments. They interact with external environment, which is physical, biological, disease agents, da, 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 and all these things. Individual biology behaviors are much more immediate causes. As I've given you in the example of the person who was hit by a car, most of the people were thinking about, you know, bleeding, da, da, bleeding tendencies. Let's say that guy who was hit by a car had a bleeding tendency and had a very small cut in their body, but that cut could not heal. It could not clot the blood. So they kept bleeding, 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 unnecessarily, even if the accident was small. 
So the cause would be bleeding, but then secondary to bleeding disorder caused by third uh, level would be being hit by a car, right? So you really want, and this is, I'm, I don't think I'm in, this is the right platform to discuss this, but I'm just going to hint it on this. You might knock, you might hit someone with a car and they would die, but you might not necessarily be the one who killed them. And this is, 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 is a whole different uh, discussion when it comes to forensics medicine. Unazo kampigia mtu ngumi moja, akanguka akafa. Wakati mungino kampigia ngumi moja, na kugeukia na kupigia ngumi kama kumi, and then you are the one who dies. So, I mean, there's all these things that you need to consider when you're looking at uh, social determinants. Well, uh, and then interventions must target multiple determinants, ecological factors. So you need to think of health from an ecological context to be able to be more cost effective uh, uh, and, and intervene. That is all I wanted to share with you. And I welcome if there's any questions. Karibu nisano.